Mrs. Rebecca Anderson. A long journey from home would bring tens of thousands of men to this place on May 12, 1864. It was a dark day of drizzle and downpours, of mud and killing. As far removed from home... For hours, the musketry and cannon thundered. A newspaperman listening from near Spotsylvania Courthouse estimated the shots. 30 cannons fired every minute. One cannon blast every two seconds. He stopped counting after six hours. But most remarkable was the musketry. Long, sustained, immense, deadly. One man recorded that he and many others fired 400 rounds that day. Innumerable survivors reported their shoulders almost immobilized by the repeated recoil of their weapons. Catherine Coos of Laurel Hill, just a mile from here, wrote down her impressions as the battle roared to its climax. Catherine Coos. Oh God, there is now the most murderous battle raging. The continuous roar of cannon, the still more terrific musketry sounds awful indeed. My feelings are intensely awful. Beyond description is this bloody struggle. It is raining hard. The whole air resounds with continuous roars. The earth shakes. Great God, how more than awful. Shells whizzing oh so fearfully. My very soul dies within me. The men hear the sound, 10,000, 20,000 men in battle was constant, even closer presence, a cacophony for 22 hours. Today, we hear just a couple of minutes. Imagine. Two hours. The question became pretty plainly, wrote, wrote one soldier, whether one was willing to meet death, not merely run the chances of it. One man said that in this gale of musket and artillery fire, few were merely wounded, 
To advance, he said, was impossible. To retreat was death. The fighting surged not just over the earthworks, but in the earthworks, as each side tried to expand the length of trenches it controlled. A soldier from North Carolina rushing into one section of the works found five captured Yankees huddling there. They were all under 20 years of age, that man remembered. All seemed to be nice, clever boys, he remembered. The colonel told Watkins to send the prisoners to the rear. T.J. Watkins, 14th North Carolina. The Yankees remarked that I had as well shoot them where they were, as it would be certain death to go out in the fusillade of shot and shell, then flying over our head. But the laws of war are inexorable, and I told them my orders. They essayed to go, but was killed every one of them before they had gone ten paces. Such is war. I never regretted any incident of the whole war more than this one. We gather here this evening as day turns to night. Few battles span both light and darkness, but this one did. Muzzle blasts of cannon and muskets alike illuminated this landscape. All day, bullets by the hundreds and thousands steadily chipped away at an immense 22-inch oak tree near the bloody angle. At midnight, it toppled over, injuring several Confederates. The crash of the tree to the ground provoked still heavier musket fire. The heaviest of the day, said one man. The night, the dead, the hours, the flash of muskets and cannon conspired to drive men to the brink of collapse. A staff officer in the 6th Corps was sent off into the night with an important order. The experience unnerved him. Thomas Hyde, 6th Corps. The only light was the firing and the dull glimmer of the faces of the dead. Feeling that the fate of all depended on me, I was wrought almost to madness. And to get my senses again, I dismounted and sat down on the ground a while holding my horse's bridle and my aching head till reason resumed its sway. Sometime after two o'clock the next morning, the morning of May 13th, word came to the Mississippians and the Carolinians holding the works around the bloody angle that the new line they had been fighting for was ready. They could go. Quietly, they slipped out of the earthworks and through the bullet-swept bullet woods behind their line, and soon they were safe. After 22 hours of continuous combat, the field fell silent. David Holt, 16th Mississippi. We halted in a pasture and broke ranks. Then came the reaction. All moved by the same impulse, we sat down on the wet ground and wept, not silently, but vociferously and long, officers and men together. The next morning, a civilian traveling with the Union Army walked to the angle. The silence was intense, he said, as he looked over a scene disfigured beyond anything he had ever seen before. I remember that I st as I stood there, I was almost startled to hear a bird twittering in a tree. The immense human wreckage here set this place apart. Men stood astonished at what they had wrought, what they had done to each other. The survivors, wrote one soldier, inured to all of war's horrors, found new horrors here. Two men went to recover the remains of a friend who fell atop the Confederate works. They especially wanted to find a gold watch the soldier had been given for Christmas, so they re could return it as a memento to his parents at home. John Black, 145th Pennsylvania. We found the remains where they fell. There had been no time to remove them, and they had lain on top of the works during the entire engagement. Had it not been for some of his comrades who had seen him fall and identified the place, we never would have recognized it as being a soldier. There was no semblance of humanity about the mass that was lying before us. The only thing I could liken it to was a sponge. I presume 5,000 bullets had passed through it. 
and after a careful search, the largest piece of the watch we could find was three lengths of the chain, not to exceed one quarter of an inch in length. The watch was entirely shot away. Miles away, beyond the makeshift hospitals, a civilian volunteer assisted in an equally makeshift cemetery created to bury those who had died in the ambulances coming from these fields. Some graves had headboards to identify them. Many did not. Unknowns. Thousands of times at Spotsylvania, loved ones turned soldiers became only a memory. U.S. Christian Commission Delegate. Wrapped in a soldier's blanket, the cold earth was their covering. They have perished. Where and when, no man can tell. Yet these unidentified graves are the most eloquent witnesses to a generous and just patriotism. At these mounds, the thoughtful will stop to estimate the self-sacrifice and devotion to country, which prompted them to brave such peril. Relentless war, thought we, as we buried our last unrecognized one. Speak kindly and pray tenderly for our noble soldiers who face death in all its saddest and most trying forms. Do they miss me at home? Do they miss me? T'would be an assurance most dear To know that this moment some loved one Is saying I wish he were here To feel the group by the fireside Were thinking of me as I roam Oh yes, t'would be joy beyond measure To know that they missed me at home to know that they missed me at home. When twilight approaches the season that ever is sacred to song, does someone repeat my name over and sigh that I tarry so long? And is there a chord in the music that's missed when my voice is away? And a chord in each heart that awaketh Regret at my weary some stay Regret at my weary some stay